This is Keith Williams. Welcome to 5 Watt World. We're interested in helping you get the most music from the least gear. Over the years of my collecting gear, I started to notice a pattern. When I was happiest, I tended to purge gear. And when I had the most stress and anxiety, I was more often buying gear. It occurred to me that maybe my buying and selling had less to do with where I was as a musician and more to do with my state of mind. So realizing this, I decided to try to answer the two questions, when to buy gear and when to sell gear. If you enjoy the videos, don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified about new videos. And if you've already subscribed, swing by the store and grab a t-shirt or mug to support what we're doing here. There's a saying, money isn't everything unless you don't have it. And then yeah, it's everything. This logic certainly applies to the first guitar. I'm sure all of us can remember the feeling of wanting our first guitar. It's a visceral sort of desire, stirred together with so many things, music, recognition, identity. If you don't have even one, you'll need one to start playing. And if it's an electric, you're going to need an amp and maybe one dependable cable as well. So yeah, figure out a way to buy that first rig, whatever it can be. It's after that first one that things can get slippery. And as many folks have pointed out to me, once you start gigging, you might need a backup guitar as well. I talked to my buddy Rhett Schull about this. And he says that he usually has more than one guitar out on the road because of playing in different tunings. And depending on the gig, he can also break a string during a solo. If his main guitar went down, he could always grab his open E guitar, quickly retune, and be back in business. In the end, he admitted it's always been a bit of a fantasy to have owned to carry only one guitar on the road. It would be so much easier, but it just wouldn't work for him. Of course, I had a weekly jazz gig for five years, and I never broke a string. Not once. Though I did carry extras in my gig bag, of course. So it has a lot to do with the kind of music you're playing, and probably how hard you hit the guitar. So that's two reasons. Beyond that, when should we be buying gear? I feel like I need to say here, I have no stake, none at all, in how much gear anybody has. This isn't a contest where an Esquire into the front of a Fender Champ wins the most minimal rig. What I am interested in is how much is enough to get to somebody's musical vision. Everyone has to answer the question for themselves. What is enough? All I want to do is encourage us to ask that question. Having said that, let's get this out of the way. Buying more stuff won't make us happier. And why is that? There's this thing called hedonic adaptation. It's a theory that says humans have a tendency to quickly return to a relatively stable level of happiness, despite major, positive, or negative life changes. As our expectations rise, our desires increase as well, and the result is that there's no long-lasting change in our feeling of well-being after a change. This is why we're not happier when we finally get that guitar, amp, or pedal that we so long desired. We quickly realize that the new tool doesn't change the music that's coming out. Now, we might be inspired. We might even write a new tune. And who doesn't love that moment of creation? But I'll argue that it's writing something that heals the real happiness, not the thing, the action. And if we bought the guitar and left it in the case, we'd be right back on that old hedonic treadmill. It's doing something that makes us happier. So okay, after that first amp pedal, maybe the backup guitar as well, when else should we be buying gear? There's a synth channel I follow by a guy from Sweden named Bo, Bo Beats. Last year, he did a video and said something that stuck with me. So over the years that I've made music and been a creative person, I've bought a ton of gear, I sold stuff, I've lusted for gear, just like I know you guys do. And my number one rule is very simple. Don't buy things unless you're already being productive. Do not buy things in order to become productive. A few years back, I built an entire room in my house set up to play music with people. I bought a drum set and cymbals. I built a bass amp and speaker cab, a second guitar setup, a keyboard rig with a piano and an organ, then microphones, cables, stands for each station, headphones, and a headphone amp to reach each station for recording. I got it all done and assembled and never used it, not once. I had everything I needed to have a band in and even hit record for a live grab of the playing. It was an amazing project and it was a serious pile of really nice gear that took years to put together. The thing I got wrong was the order. I should have put the band together, started making music together, then start putting together the rehearsal space. Okay. 
I recently read that if social media brings you closer to spending time with people in the real world, then it's a good thing. But if it's a substitute for actually being with other humans, you might want to rethink it. This made sense to me. So what's this got to do with buying and selling gear? Well, to paraphrase, if buying gear moves us towards playing with other people, then it's a good investment. Now, I'm not saying stockpile gear because it might bring you closer to playing with other people, a modern version of being in the band because you own the PA in the van, maybe. I'm saying that if you have a specific opportunity to play music with others, and some gear would help support that, I think that's a good reason to buy gear. This is the reason I own two Vox AC-10s. Okay, they even match. Yep, yeah, I'm that guy, so <laughs> sue me. One, I keep at home for pairing with wet dry rigs with another 10 watt amp, and the other lives in a rehearsal studio where I play with friends on Wednesday nights. By having it there, all I need to do is put my Strandberg gig bag over my shoulder, grab the Nano pedal board, and I'm on my way out the door to the weekly jam. Believe me, playing music with other people will make you happier. But simply owning the gear that might get you there certainly will not. I mentioned these questions to my friend Rick, and he said, Hypes, the best reason to sell gear, that's to buy more gear. And we both laughed. There's a guy that I met through the channel that's a professional guitar player on the West Coast. We encourage each other to try to come up with powerful but small pedal boards that'll fit our pedal train Metro 16s that we both own. In the middle of the back and forth recently, we watched a video by guitarist Ariel Posen that he made going through his rig, including his pedal board. Ariel's using three different pedals from King Tone Guitars, including a Duelist. Now the Duelist is a two-sided drive pedal that Posen, Joey Landreth, and Josh Smith are all using, three of my current favorite players. So of course this got me thinking about trying one myself. The problem is that they sell for just shy of $400, and there's getting to be a waiting list on top of that. So my first response was, man, you know, I could buy a lot of great drive pedals for 100 bucks. But then I realized that this is really two pedals in one and I likely have a bunch of pedals that I'm not using on the shelf that I could sell to try one of these. If this ends up giving me my three drive sounds that I'm looking for, then in the long run, it might actually save me money. So I pulled the trigger. I sold a bunch of overdrive pedals that were gathering dust and ordered a Duelist. I'll let you know how it works out. In college and after, I had a Sunday ritual of taking out my instruments and checking them over each one. I'd sit for a few minutes with each and become reacquainted. But at some point, I had too many guitars to be able to do this anymore. So if the guitars were sitting in their cases for over a year without being played, why was I keeping them? Do you know this term FOMO? I came across it in a video a couple years ago. It stands for fear of missing out. I'd never heard it before. If you have gear that you thought you needed, but you never get around to using it, it might be this fear of missing out thing. You see, we've been convinced that, as a serious guitarist, we owe it to ourselves to have that thing, whatever that thing is. But by definition, if we aren't using it, we don't really need it now. Now, second guessing can kick in here because we might spend, have spent years looking for just the right thing. A Les Paul that sounds like a Les Paul but weighs less than eight pounds. And yeah, I used to have one of those. Or a nice light Telecaster with a bridge pickup that doesn't make your ears want to bleed. I understand those feelings, profoundly. But here's what I'll say. After all these years, I learned that gear can always be replaced. That there's no such thing as the perfect guitar. Well, unless we decide it is. And the only thing that you can't replace is a drummer that doesn't overplay. I was talking about this with a friend of mine who owns a bike shop. As you guessed, he'd probably had some really tricked out road bikes over the years. And in response to my kicking around these ideas with him, he said, you know, I remember all my great rides with friends, but I don't remember what bike I was riding when I did them. This next one's a version of sell gear to buy other gear. One great guitar beats five average guitars. Like most things, I learned this one the hard way. I actually have a real affection for inexpensive guitars. To be able to find a new sound for a few hundred dollars on reverb or eBay, that's pretty seductive. But I learned over time that less expensive instruments are more expensive to maintain, tend to be more attention from the guitar tech, tend not to stay in tune as well, and are more likely to have electrical issues. Now many of you, like me, could do these things for yourselves. But at some point, probably around eight to 10 instruments, I was spending way too much time doing maintenance so that it was cutting into my playing time. I heard David Grissom once say in an interview that it gets to the point where the guitars own you. 
In my case, I sold off the two dozen inexpensive instruments I had and ended up with three PRS guitars, all of which, due to their superior engineering, I could do simple adjustments on myself and proceeded to get to know those guitars and play them for the next 10 years. And then there's the version of selling what you're not using, but with a pretty substantial twist that I hear from many, many subscribers. Sentimental attachment. I've got the big story on this one. When I was 13 or 14, I started wanting a guitar of my own. And of course, I was lusting after an electric guitar. My uncle came across an old acoustic guitar that a friend of the family had. She was 83, and the guitar had belonged to her father. So my father and I went to see it. It was this sweet little parlor guitar, which I later learned was built in New York or Chicago around 1915. It had Brazilian rosewood back and side, a German spruce top, engraved inlays in the fretboard, and mother of pearl around the entire top. It looked like a miniature Martin D45. <laughs> and I couldn't have been less interested in the guitar. And seeing that on my face, my father said he'd pay half because he just thought it was cool. So I coughed up $70 in apple picking money, and my dad put in $70 and I had my first guitar. And I played it very little. In the following decades, it needed the neck reset, and I spent the considerable money to have that done. You know, I think I did it out of a sense of obligation to the memory, but I still almost never played it. And when one day I learned that my friend and guitar tech extraordinaire was looking for a guitar almost exactly like that one, I sold it to him. I'd come to realize that not having that guitar sitting in the case in the corner would in no way affect my memory of having bought that guitar with my father. And sitting here right now, I still know exactly what that old guitar smells like, and I take delight in knowing that Chris is playing it with his family. As I've said before, spending money and buying gear often feels like progress when it's really just gathering. And we're programmed by evolution to gather, but it's important to know that it has more to do with our feelings of being safe than it has to do with our musicianship. So buy gear that brings you joy, that takes you closer to the sound in your head, and have that gear bring you closer to making music with other people because that's a real thing, time with other people, and that'll make you happy in a way that stuff just won't. Don't forget to subscribe and click the bell icon to be notified of new videos. And until the next time, thanks for being a part of the 5 Watt world. Mm -hmm.